in 2031. What is your prediction for the price of Bitcoin? So going into 2031, let's say, that Bitcoin will have continued its growth trajectory. It will have played out another one of these price cycles. Possibly uh, its price cycle will have broken and it just gone into a long, slow grind upwards as people realize it's a game of accumulation. And I think Bitcoin by this time will have reached about 20% of global purchasing power. So this would imply Bitcoin's market cap in 2031 dollars to be about $250 trillion. So that's about one fifth of global M2 stored in Bitcoin. Now, accounting for inflation, that means Bitcoin's market cap in today's dollars would be about 20 trillion. So in 2031 dollars, and this is a very bright line to distinguish, I think Bitcoin by the year 2031 will be north of 12 and a half million dollars per Bitcoin. Jesus. But Twelve and a half million per coin. Twelve and a half million. But adjusting for inflation, it will only feel like north of one one million dollars per Bitcoin in twenty twenty one dollars because a dollar will have lost so much of its value by then. Twelve and a half million dollars will spin like one million dollars. So that's my prediction for by twenty thirty one, and then that's going to clearly have some big impact on fiat currencies, including the dollar. Well, again, that goes back to Gresham's law is that the more fake money they, what, what you're talking about is when they, in, they increase M2 and M3 and all other stuff they, they taught me in economics, which I forgot, mm. it's just printing more money. That's all they're doing. Right. And so that's what gives Bitcoin and the blockchain chain technology so much more credibility than the central bank money, fake money, I call it. That's right. Um, it, it's so it, as I've said in the past episode with you, actually, it's a pyramid scheme. Oh God. Yes. When we say printing money, you're not actually creating any new wealth or value. No. You're just shifting the claims on existing capital and you're stealing from those that are dependent on the dollar to hold its value, which are the poor, those living on fixed income, retirees, pensioners, you're stealing from the most economically vulnerable. Right. And giving to those with access uh, to the freshly printed money. In my opinion, every time we print money, we just create more poor people. The whole world, the whole thing's built on lies. And I would argue, and I think many Bitcoiners would argue, it, all, it starts and ends with the money. We have a lie built into our money, right? right. The paper was once redeemable mm -hmm. for gold. That became a lie. Because the they violated Gresham's law. We, we produced law. bad money. That's right. Throughout history, the Romans did it, Germans did it, Zimbabwe did it, Venezuela's doing it, everybody's doing it. And now we have Bitcoin, blockchain, Ethereum. You know, clearly I'm very focused on Bitcoin. I'm not, I don't advocate for other cryptocurrencies. I don't think Ethereum is gonna be a big deal um, or as big of a deal as, as Bitcoin. I think gold, it's a 5,000 year old technology, will only be disrupted once. And that is by Bitcoin. And that's what we're gonna see play out over the next 10 years. So with Bitcoin by 2031, north of $12.5 million per coin, it's equal to about 20% of the global purchasing power. So it's about half the dollar's value in total. But again, the dollar will have increased according to the law of accelerating issuance and depreciation. Its issuance rate will have increased, I'm predicting to north of 145% by the early 2030s. This would be early stage hyperinflation. Uh, or you could say actually probably medium stage hyperinflation. Typically a currency won't last more than a few years. Couldn't somebody just create their own Bitcoin and their own network and just blow Bitcoin out of the water? So this is a nuanced answer to the question. Um, it's not a straightforward question to answer because many people think, oh, iPhone disrupted Blackberry, Facebook disrupted MySpace, something can disrupt Bitcoin. Uh, the first answer would be money itself. Why is money as a network valued? And it turns out that there are properties to money, divisibility, durability, recognizability, portability, scarcity. And then the network that gets built up around that is valued based on how liquid it is. 
uh, and, and what the network effects are. So how many people you can exchange with. New investors always prefer the most liquid money. Right. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, basically. It's the, the same reason, the argument I commonly make is the same quantifiable reasons we only have one analog gold. We will only, for those same reasons, we will only have one digital gold. And then again, if you look at those properties of money that gold best satisfied historically, divisibility, durability, recognizability, portability, scarcity, Bitcoin has essentially perfected them. It's a pure digital asset, so it's infinitely divisible. It's stored in a distributed way, so the information does not break down. This is something like the Bible, right? The Bible's outlasted empires because it's distributed information. It's infinitely portable because it's digital. You can move it at the speed of light. Uh, it's infinitely recognizable, meaning you can audit the total supply, you can run a node, you can verify the money supply. Anyone can do it anywhere for free. And then finally, it has perfect scarcity. Um, it's the first asset in human history that we know has an absolutely fixed supply and no one can change. So why couldn't somebody just create their own coins? I mean, so, aren't, aren't they going to? And they do. There's thousands of them out there. Um, because if you're trying to compete with Bitcoin directly as money, and it has perfected those five properties of money, there's essentially no design space left to introduce a feature that could disrupt Bitcoin. Well, here's the thing. Assuming even if these guys are the next Einstein and they've figured out something else that money needs that none of us knew it needed, should they go into the market, they sell this coin, it starts to have some success, Bitcoin is still adaptive. It's open source technology. So if there's a feature they've developed that makes money better, which we don't know of one, again, Bitcoin can absorb that feature set. It's open source technology. It can still, it resists harmful changes, but it, it can uh, absorb useful changes, let's say. So this further insulates it. So it's adaptable, it's flexible, it'll change. It's a living money, right? Bitcoin too, the difficulty adjustment itself, the harder we try to mine Bitcoin, it actually adapts, it responds to human action and becomes more difficult to produce over time. That is the game. Is it's, um, it's the first money that's responsive to human action. If you look at Bitcoin through that lens, Bitcoin has a four-sided network effect. We have buyers in Bitcoin, we have sellers of Bitcoin, we have the miners, and then we have all the entrepreneurs building on top of and around it. So if you're gonna try and disrupt this network, you have to introduce a superior value proposition that Bitcoin can somehow not absorb. Again, it's open source software, it can absorb features that are useful. And you have to convince this, this entire global network that's four-sided to move simultaneously. And the whole thing is centered on a trillion dollar asset now. Typically when these networks get above 100 billion, they become dominant.